Now, um, Judge President, you know, maybe just going back to some of the questions we had gone through, and I even said earlier on that you were tipped to become Chief Justice, yes. which you responded to. I proudly call myself Chief Justice that South Africa never had and never will have. <laughs> uh, I don't think I stand a chance. Uh, I've been marginalized and too much controversy has been created deliberately around me to block me. It is my hope one day that the truth will come out, particularly with regard to all these allegations that have been leveled against me. Perhaps if you ask me, had I been appointed as a Chief Justice, what contribution was I going to make? I can tell you straight away. There are quite a few things that I would have wanted to introduce. One of the things I've already mentioned, making sure that we internalize the Constitution, we make our judgment, our judgments speak to the people of South Africa, rather than relying too much on foreign law and writing long judgments, helping every South African, particularly people from poor and marginalized communities, internalize the constitution, uh, making sure that the law reaches out. There are some outreach projects, even at the schools and so on, because education is a long-term solution. We need that. But most importantly, I can assure you, had I been Chief Justice, I would have written a judgment which questions the relevance of the law prior to 1994. We find that today, earlier on, one of the colleagues made reference to, uh, you would find that there are judges in this country who would quote, for instance, a judgment of the appellate division, as it was then known, in 1943 or 1947, to interpret a concept of human rights, which human rights did not exist, by the way, until we have this constitution. How do you interpret a constitution, which is the product of democracy, which was founded after 1994, with reference to a decided case that was decided by an apartheid-appointed judge in 1947 or 1932? It just doesn't make sense. I question, in my view, the relevance of the law in this country, the so-called common law, which uh, law was in place before 1994. I question its relevance. To me, that law must be treated with great caution, right? We need to develop a new jurisprudence, new ethos that find their relevance, their origin directly from the Constitution. One of the things I do not like, there is a judgment of the Constitutional Court in terms of which an affected citizen must first look to common law for solution. It's called the subsidiary principle. In other words, if you claim that, if you allege that your rights have been violated one way or the other, you must first look to the constitution for, uh, sorry, you must first look to the common law and find a remedy in common law. Now, with respect, I have a problem with that. We had no right to vote before 1994. Why are we looking at the law which is foreign to us, which was forced down our throat, right? Because the law prior to 1994, we had no right to vote. As African people, we had our own legal system in this country, right? This, which is now, it has been relegated to the background. It's called African customary law. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ironically, 80% of the population, myself included, we practice this. I pray the law more. Right, that's practicing African law, right? So you have a situation whereby a legal system like African customary law, which is practiced by the vast majority of the people on a daily basis, is relegated to the background. But the law of the oppressor, the law of the colonizer, the law of someone who came and forcibly took your land is the law that you embrace at the expense of your own culture. It doesn't make sense. I would have insisted on an agenda that clearly transforms the South African judiciary, that clearly overhauls the South African legal system so that we start literally afresh on a relatively clean slate and start to embrace the new ethos 
of our constitution and look for solutions directly from the constitution as opposed to looking for solutions from the common law, which law is not common to me at all. Right, so one of the questions that I came across on Facebook and I thought I should read this one out and maybe, you know, get your own views regarding yes. the, uh, 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 this concern is um, one of the Facebook users was actually asking, you know, the question with regards to the separation of powers yes. between the judiciary, judiciary and executive and parliament. And parliament. Yes. So now this, uh, this is how the question goes, and I quote, the separation of powers system has presented a lot of counter-intuitive challenges in terms of passing legislation, taking the country's executive to task, and the use of judiciary to interfere with debated, uh, with debated um, parliamentary issues. That's right. How, how, how have you actually countered that? I mean, like, obviously, there's the judiciary, the executive, and sometimes you find it. I'll make an example about, yeah, parliament, for example. I'm making an example about, you know, the, the Nkandla Gate. Overrated, where, yes. where Where we had one chapter of nine of the, you know, yes. the constitution mm. saying that the president must actually pay back the money used for the work that was done at Nkandla. Mm -hmm. And then in parliament, that was actually, you know, a different story with the, mm. you know, uh, parliament having found that the, the investigation that was conducted by the then sitting minister, Tulas Nguesi, where he said that, in fact, everything that was done in that project was done within the books of the law. That's right. And you had the judiciary saying that, in fact, the president must pay back the money. Some of the money, that's now, right. Now, 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 with all this confusion that was happening there, how do you make of it? What is it that you can say about that, the separation of powers? Well, the separation of powers is healthy in any democracy. Our roles are complementary, right? When I say our roles, I'm referring to the three organs of government, being the parliament, the executive, and the judiciary. Our roles are complementary. There should be no competition in any ideal situation. Uh, it is our role as the judiciary to interpret the law, but as I have said earlier on, in interpreting the law, we are guided by our own value systems, we are guided by our own upbringing and so on. The judiciary, I must say, we should be careful not to be overzealous, not to get carried away. We should respect the, the terrain of the executive, whose duty is to carry the law into effect. We should also respect the terrain of parliament whose duty is to make the law. Our duty is to make sure that the laws that parliament makes are in accordance with the law and the constitution. So in any healthy democracy, there should be no tension between the three organs of state. But from time to time, we are a young democracy. I think a healthy debate or a reasonable tension would be expected. Now, to go back to the Nganda scenario, the judgment, obviously, of the Constitutional Court, the majority judgment, uh, the, I think, if I remember well, the majority judgment, the, the Constitutional Court, by majority, ruled that President uh, Zuma should pay back the money, that which was advanced, which had nothing to do with security. But if anything, that's a clear indication that each of the three organs is independent of yeah. each other and exercises its supervisory role independently of each other. So we have a judiciary which is independent. Right, so we've got just about um, yesterday, I think there was a judgment that came you know, against the current public protector. That's right. Uh, with Parliament wanting to institute a commission that will actually look into um, 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 the role of the current sitting uh, public protector and whether she has capacity to preside over that office. That's right. And now she lost a case mm. in the Western Cape Judiciary. She's part of the Chapter 9 institution. Now, some political parties are saying that she should go and some are saying no. She should say I understand you cannot really, you know, go into detail of that as a sitting That's judge. That's right. But I would want to hear from, you know, because this matter was sitting right here in the Western Cape where you had the judiciary at the province. How do you make of the noise that is made around, you know, the, the public protector? Say, for example, it was actually the chief justice who is, you know, either the same 
pressure of having mm. political parties that's suggesting right. that he should go. Mm. And then now this one, public mm. protector, some parties say she should go. Mm. What do you make of that? Well, my view is simply this. The judgment has been pronounced. There's been a pronouncement by the court. Uh, the public protector has every right through her legal team to study the judgment. F they may decide to appeal. I don't know whether the judgment is appealable or whether they wish to appeal. But I would, my own view is that that process must be respected. It is for her as a litigant to decide what to do with the judgment. If she's not happy and the judgment is appealable, nothing stops her from appealing. Now, as to the kind of noise and vibe created by political parties, that's why they are politicians. You would expect politicians to say something in any event. But my appeal to all South Africans would be uh, she should be given a chance like any other South African. If she wants to appeal the judgment, she's entitled to do that. And the, the, the process must unfold. Right. It may well be that this is a process that has been initiated. The process itself must be followed through. And uh, I cannot predict now. I can't speculate as to what the outcome of that process would be. But I think all of us, public protector, political parties, and, and then the judiciary, all of us must respect the judgment of the court. And as I say, if it is appealable and the public protector wishes to appeal against that judgment, she will be acting within her right. But she should not be forced to step down and abandon her rights. She's entitled to exercise her rights, whichever way she wants to exercise them. I think it's premature to suggest that she must be uh, impeached. Based on what? Because if in the process may find that she is not guilty at the end of the day, we should be careful not to prejudge the, uh, not to prejudge the process. My understanding is that the judgment simply allows, it paves the way for Parliament to make rules. It doesn't say the public protector is guilty. That's my understanding. I haven't read the judgment. <laughs> but I would appeal to all South Africans to respect the judgment. So. I've issue, covered that. Yes, you have. Thank you very right, much. Sir. On the issue of land reform, hmm. there is an ongoing debate. That's right. With regards to the issue of land. Hmm. You know, some people feel, you know, a lot of people, people, including myself, feel that, um, you know, majority of black people are landless. Yes. And now there has been proposals that we must amend Section 25 of the Constitution. Constitution that's right. Parliament is following on that. Yes. I don't know how far they are with the process. That's right. I just want to get your views around that matter in terms of land reform. What has been done, what is happening now, and what you think can actually be done to fast track the process? Well, my view, the issue of land as an African person is very close to me. Land is not only about owning it and residing there or grazing your cattle, but it's about restoring our dignity. We all know we were conquered at gunpoint. Our land was not given by our forefathers freely to our conquerors. They paid a heavy price. They were killed. So there is absolutely no doubt that if we want an everlasting, we want everlasting peace in this country, issues of land redistribution must be addressed sooner rather than later. We, uh, I'm a farmer myself in a very small way. The issue of land is very close to me. But there are huge areas where the government may want to look into. For instance, if I may be allowed to, to, to put my views on the table, mm -hmm. there are farmers who, individual farmers, who own huge farms that they cannot conceivably uh, cultivate or plow or till on their own. I'm not going to mention names. There are people who own 65,000 hectares of land alone. There are farmers in this country who have 10, 12, 15 farms. Some of them have not even seen their farms, but they have enough money to buy that land, and it belongs to them. There is land in this part of the world which is owned by Europeans who have never been to Africa. They inherited that land 
from their great grandfathers who happened to have had some connection before with South Africa. They are, there are farms in this country where the owners have defaulted. They have not paid the land bank. Strictly speaking, that those farms should be confiscated by the government. So it's a huge range of areas or pockets of land that, in my view, the government can seriously look into with a view to ensuring a speedy resolution of the problem. But the issue to do with land redistribution should not be negotiated at all. In my view, it is not negotiable. And uh, it will re just one of the ways in which we will be able to restore the dignity of so many people in this country. Also, land ownership. I don't think every South African is, wants to become a commercial farmer. We have to reintroduce what is known as subsistence farming in this country. People who get a small piece of land, even smaller than an acre, whereby you can put your small house, put, uh, put up your small house, and then you can uh, have a small piece of land. You have two or three chickens, four or five goats. You are able to plant crops, your mealies, uh, your beans, and so on. You are basically planting and cultivating that land in order to feed your family and your immediate friends. That is called subsistence farming as opposed to commercial farming. Not all of us have millions and billions of friends to be able to embark on commercial farming. If subsistence farming were to be reintroduced, I can guarantee one thing. A lot of people who live rural areas because there is no work, there is poverty, and go to Soweto and go to Johannesburg and go to Walanga and go to these big cities and end up sleeping under the bridge. That will be addressed because there will be uh, land in their own areas where they live and would encourage them to cultivate that land and the government will be able to help them where they are. That's just one way of avoiding unnecessary influx control and the level of poverty that we see in the shacks. These are largely people who leave rural areas in search for greener pastures, but when they get to the bigger cities, there is a long queue of unemployed people, people who live under the bridge. The result is that there is a cycle of poverty. When the government gives those people, for instance, houses, they have no means. Some of them fall into the temptation of selling those homes in order to feed their home families back in the rural areas. So the issue of restoring land to those who are dispossessed of land, in my view, is not negotiable. The government should seriously facilitate that. It will go a long way towards improving the quality of life, particularly of poor people in this country. And it will go a long way in terms of reducing unemployment. Now, the citizens of this country are running very impatient and people are like, but the process has been ongoing for too long. Yes. And yet we are not seeing the results or the fruits of the processes, you know, that is actually undertaken by government. That's right. There are land grabs that are happening, are happening mm. all over the country. We are seeing reports mm. every day. People are saying these guys live comfortably in their own spaces. That's they right. do not they know don't what care they're going about through. us. Therefore, yes. identify land, and you know, mm. a leader of a political party, you know, EFF Julius Malema says that if you see a beautiful piece of land and you like it, mm. it's not occupied, you must go for it. Mm. And we have seen that people getting arrested and of that. So um, you, as the judge, president of the Western Cape, yes. acknowledging that there is indeed a need for land to be made accessible, mm. for land to be released to the people. Yes, are sir. you in support of the land grabs that you are seeing? 
Land grabs can never be locked in isolation. It happens everywhere in the world. The moment citizens feel that the law does not adequately address their needs, their challenges, their aspirations, people will always be tempted to take the law into their hands. We can multiply examples. If people in the township feel that there is lawlessness, women are getting raped day and night, what do people do? They catch the rapists, they themselves deal with that person who is accused of being a rapist. Mob so justice. The, it's mob justice. So this is exactly the same thing that is happening, but in a slightly different context. People have no land, they have no dignity, they sleep under the bridges, it is cold, they are desperate. What do you expect? That person is going to see an empty piece of land which is unoccupied and that person is going to move in and put up an, in an informal settlement. By the way, I hate the word shack. <laughs> These are residences. It's our people who live there, and we must give them dignity. If we continue to say these are shacks, it is actually derogatory. I prefer to call it a house. That's what it is. It is a residence. It may be an informal structure, but it is a residence. So as a judge, the Constitution makes it clear uh, and uh, I have to uphold the Constitution. I cannot uh, uh, support the notion of land grabbing because it is unlawful. Yeah. All I'm saying, I can contextualize it. I can understand why people resort to self-help. All the more reason for our government to act speedily without delay, make sure more and more land is redistributed. I was encouraged about a week or so ago, I saw Minister Togo Tidiza yes. making an announcement on television that more than 500,000 hectares of yes, land yes. will be redistributed. I'm hoping that there will be more land, more than just that, which will be redistributed. I have made numerous examples of land where parliament, where our government should feel free to move in. For instance, those farmers with huge farms, there is no reason why they cannot uh, uh, cut down some of these farms and some sections or portions of the farm donated to the government of poor communities. Those people who have never even seen their farms here but live here. People who are not in fact paying for their farms. Another example is people who are committing crimes on their farms. Yes. If I take my car, I, my gun, I commit a crime with it, I shoot you, I will never get that gun back. What about land? What about a farmer who buries people, who kills people? who commits murder on his farm. Why can't that farm be confiscated by the state? Because it is a product of crime. Yes. Another example where the government can move in without delay is yeah. those farmers who own a, a lot of farms. Yes. So much that they are greedy. There are farmers here who have 14 farms in different parts of the country, mm. right? Because they are so rich, they can afford that. We cannot afford that. I would support a principle of one farm per farmer so that we can reintroduce, exactly, we can reintroduce subsistence farming in that way that will address so many problems associated with poverty, landlessness, and uh, economic deprivation. I, I, you know, I sense from the things we have discussed so far that there is some sort of, you know, suppression when it comes to black thought leadership. Mm. And I'm saying this because you made mention of, you know, mm. um, your racism report, which That's you wrote, right. published, and you had a lot of people coming at you, mm. you know, um, some of them threatening to do all sorts of things to you. That's right. And um, now, don't you perhaps think that indeed the public outcry by many people, your social media influencers saying that it seems there is a deliberate attack, you know, meant for, for, for black leaders. Yes. Don't you think that particular narrative does exist? And what do you make of it? Well, I agree with that entirely. We have seen this in a number of situations earlier on, even in South Africa. I'm not the only victim uh, of this uh, onslaught whereby black people who come out and uh, raise certain issues 
in support of the overall agenda of empowering our people are shot down. There have been many such instances. Uh, I prefer not to mention names, but this is not an unusual phenomenon. I think the, the enemy works as follows. They try to co-opt you. Mm -hmm. If they succeed, they will use you. You become a shining example because at that point you are just their spokesman, <laughs> right? I rather be a, I rather be a free man in my grave than live as a puppet, right? So you become a puppet. They control you, right? And I'm not one of those people. If you are yourself and you are speaking about certain issues that are close to your heart, which issues will benefit? poor people who are largely from the uh, black community and you do not succumb to their pressure. They isolate you. They put you in a cage like a monkey. Every time they want to go for you, they know you are in a cage, completely isolated. You become a laughing stock. They make an example of you so that generations to come will not do what you did. What you did. Right? That is exactly what they decided to do with me. I saw attempts that I should, for instance, not talk about the racism report, that I should sweep it under the carpet. Attempts to say to me, I am mad, I'm unstable when I say there is racism. It was a deliberate and desperate attempt to co-opt me. I refused. I refused. I said, I'm not going to be co-opted. I'm not a puppet. I am myself. I chose to be myself. I chose to stand for the truth. And I am still suffering even today. So it is, uh, it is not just a perception. It is something that is real. I have seen it in this country, whereby particularly black people who stand up for justice, who stand up against uh, all forms of abuse, are isolated or co-opted. If you don't comply, you don't uh, show signs or willingness of being co-opted, you are isolated, then insulted for the rest of your life, and they make an example of you. Correct. Um, that's quite mouthful. Now, this reminds me of you know um, a report I read yes. where the former public protector, Tulima Donsele, is of the view that there should be you know, some sort of corruption amnesty Mm. so that we may start afresh and um, perhaps, you know, deal with, you know, the mm. corruption cases that we have all over the country mm -hmm. and maybe find some way of starting afresh. I, I did not really, yes. you know, get exactly where she was going with this whole mm. thing because in my view as an individual, as a citizen of this country, every person who commits crime, mm. corruption, must actually account be it white or black, they must all account. Politicians, non-politicians, they are all the same. They are all equal as me under the rule of the law. Right. What do you yes. mean? I agree with that approach. For me, I have a problem when you say we must have amnesty in respect of corruption. A rapist is going to say the same thing. Why can't we have amnesty in respect of rapists? Every man who has raped before today must be let free. Where do you draw the line? Right. So I have a problem with that. Uh, my view is that where a crime has been committed, not fabricated, and there is evidence, uh, the law must take its course. The accused person has an option to plead guilty and uh, face a lenient sentence or not plead guilty. If he's found guilty, the law must take its course. Corruption is obviously on the rise and it is yes. not for uh, for one to condone it, it must be outrooted in all forms. I'm not so sure whether having an amnesty in respect of corruption would work. Ask yourself, if we are going to adopt it, when would that happen? There are people whose names, for instance, have been mentioned or who have been implicated in the Zondo Commission. I have no doubt they would want that. But where do you draw the line? So that is really my problem. I have not read the report of Advocate Tuli Matonsela. I do not know what informed her in terms of making those re recommendations. But in principle, the idea whereby you are going to have amnesty for certain crimes, in this case corruption, 
but not other crimes is problematic. As I say, every murderer would want <laughs> amnesty. Every rapist would want amnesty as well. Where do you draw the line? That's just my <laughs> principal problem. Right. So as we were coming here to have the interview with the judge president of the Western Cape, I expected this massive security around and yet we found nothing. We're actually roaming around freely. And I'm asking myself, why is it that the entire, the whole of judge president of the Western Cape does not have bodyguards around himself? And yet we, we've got a deputy, your deputy, judge, um, um, deputy president Goliath, who has private security. At state's expense. You know, around here, like what is, what is going on? How is this assessment done? How, is it, how, how did it come about? Like, All right, I'll explain that. Uh, <clears throat> there are two ways, to my knowledge, in terms of which a judge can be allocated bodyguards. The first relates to one's position. I'm a judge president. I'm entitled by law. There was a decision taken by cabinet that judges president must be protected. I have two protectors. They are board warrant officers in the employ of the state. So protection is in line with my office as a judge president. Only heads of court are protected. That is the chief justice, the deputy chief justice, president of the Supreme Court of Appeal, the deputy president of the Supreme Court of Appeal, and all judges president. It ends there. The deputy judge president in this country is not protected by law. She is not a VIP. She is not allocated any VIP protectors. It is a fact I have two VIP protectors. You may not see them now, but they are officially mine. They are allocated to me. But obviously, I'm sitting here in a farm. I am happy to not to have them right here for purposes of this interview. Now, talking about Judge Goliath, the, there was an article which surfaced in the newspapers in September, early in September, to the effect that her life was threatened uh, and that the thing I was pointing at me, that I was part of the collusion, I was the mastermind behind the assassination. The term that was used was assassination, that there was a plot not to kill her, but to assassinate her, and that I was involved in this assassination plot. I found that shocking, to say the least. Why would I kill a fellow human being and Nohal, a woman? What has she done? I have never done that. I deny it categorically. I have no intention to kill anyone. I was never involved in any assassination plot. The sad part of it is this. The report, the Jigs report, that is being relied upon on the basis of which she was given security by the office of the Chief Justice behind my back. That report itself makes it very, very clear that there is no credible source of the threat against Justice Goliath. So you have a situation which is strange, which is unprecedented. There are bodyguards in the building who are protecting me and other judges like Fordain whose life has been threatened and there is a credible report from crime intelligence to that effect. And these rogue units in the building who we do not even know who they are, they are not policemen, they are policemen and women, they are not from SAPS. I have made inquiries, I am told they work for a private security company they were employed by the Office of the Chief Justice. This has been imposed on us, and I was not involved uh, in affording protection to Goliath. Whenever a judge in my division, whenever the life of a judge is threatened, I'm the first person to know. Not so long ago, for instance, there was an attempt to kill one of the judges in the division. The plan was to kill that judge in court as he delivered the judgment. I was one of the first people to be informed in that building. We took adequate steps. I can tell you straight away, 
we were able to act speedily, acting on information from crime intelligence. There were four people who were arrested in full uniform. They were posing as policemen. Hmm. They were coming to shoot that particular judge in court. That goes to show the extent to which I get involved in the provision of security to judges and everybody will be alerted in the building. This time around is the first time that I have never been contacted by whoever provided security to Judge Goliath. The reason why the corpse subs is not involved is plain enough. She's not a VIP. She does not meet that criterion. And there is no valid or credible threat against her life. Corps would never protect her. That's why they've resorted to a private company whose credentials are not even known. It is an abuse of state resources. There is no threat against Judge Goliath. There is no registered threat. It is an abuse of state resources, to say the least. I think, um, borrowing from the article which I believe you read and I also read, does the name of a man, an individual, that comes out and he alleges that he was actually, um, I don't know, hired by, by, by yourself to assassinate the Deputy Judge, uh, Judge President Goliath. Uh, I read the report myself, sorry to interject. I found it shocking that judges, including Cameron, who is a seasoned judge, would act on that nonsense. The report is not conclusive, if anything, it does not say there is any threat against Judge Goliath. It says this gentleman, whatever his name, uh, April, he, first of all, he had a motive to lie. He wanted to be released on bail. That is included in the report. They asked him, why are you saying this? He said, no, it's because I want to be out on bail and attend my trial from home. So he clearly had a motive to lie. It is not uncommon for prisoners to fabricate reports of this nature because they want favors from the prison authorities. Do you know why they are running with that report? It is because my name is there. If it was a name of any human being under the sun, there is not a single individual who would have taken that report seriously. This is yet another desperate and desperate, deliberate and desperate attempt to tarnish my reputation. I can assure you it won't fly again. It is nonsense. Why would I want to kill a non-entity and make a martyr? Now with all the controversy around you, Judge President, and don't you think perhaps it's time that you actually get to sit down with uh, Chief Justice Mukhuing and, you know, maybe explain your side of the story, given the fact that your deputy has gone to have a meeting in Johannesburg with the CJ. Don't you think maybe you should do the same? I mean, he's your senior. Shouldn't yes. you just, you know, maybe address all these concerns directly to him? Well, I have tried in the past, as we speak now, I have written three letters to Chief Justice Mukhuing. He is yet to acknowledge even receipt of them. There is a letter that I wrote to him the day before yesterday, complaining bitterly about the presence of this security in the building, because I can see we are sitting on a time bomb. It won't be too long that there is actual shooting in the building. He has not even acknowledged receipt And when was this letter written? The letter was dated the 9th. And the nine was the day before yesterday. It okay. was yesterday. I wrote it yesterday. But this year alone, I have written, this was the third letter. I wrote him, for instance, when there were judges in my division who refused to sit with Judge Parker and said Judge Parker was lying. I wrote to Judge Mukwenge. He did not even acknowledge receipt of my letter. I do not think it would be proper for me to uh, to arrange a private meeting with Justice Mukhoeng, who is clearly hostile to me. I don't know what I did to him. And uh, I would expect him to reply to the complaint, a valid complaint that I have filed against him and will meet in the JSC. That's what I'm expecting from him. He must reply and will meet at the JSC. He is not yeah. above the law. 
I'm not above the law. Mohueng, Chief Justice, with respect, is also not above the law. Any other pending cases at the JSC? And maybe to add on that, do you have confidence in the processes of the JSC? That's a very good question. My name has been in the public domain for far too long for all kinds of nonsensical reasons, ranging from a plot to kill a fellow judge, or in certain instances where, for instance, there are judges in my division who have reserve judgments, you see headlines, Klope has 16 reserve judgments. That has been done deliberately to tarnish my reputation, right? I think I'm wise enough to see that that has been done deliberately to tarnish my reputation. I can only say to you, I'm glad I'm still standing. But it has been done deliberately to tarnish my reputation. But it is my hope that one day the truth will come out. And again, in terms of the Judicial Services Commission, yes, the tribunal, do you have confidence in that? Uh, I have confidence in the process. Uh, in terms of, I am not scared to appear before the Judicial Service Commission. But it's one of those things where you say to yourself, why, whenever I'm about to appear before the JSC, my name is again, my reputation is always tarnished. And remember, even the, the members of the tribunal read these newspapers, right? So as much as I have confidence in the Judicial Service Commission and the process itself, but it is always a matter of concern that my name is always dragged through the mud because that is done deliberately. I mean, right now I have no doubt that the complaint that was brought by Patricia Goliath against me uh, in January relating, ranging from my allocation of work, favoring my wife in the allocation of work, the alleged assault against Judge Park. All of that was done deliberately because they knew they were going to bring back this complaint that stems back 18 and a half years ago in 2008 where it was alleged I attempted to influence judges of the Constant Court. It failed then, they want to resuscitate now. But before the date of the hearing, they decided to create a cloud, a storm around me, so that when I go for the hearing, the public knows already. This is public lynching. The public says, oh, we're sick and tired of this job. The other day he did this, he assaulted his judge. The other day uh, he was plotting to kill his deputy. We are sick and tired of this club. So it's done deliberately. Not forgetting that you even have people like retired Judge Krechler who feed on me. He does not behave like a judge when it comes to me. He does not believe there is a presumption of innocence when it comes to me. He reads anything in the newspapers and then he's the first to go on TV and say Klope must go. So when it comes to other judges, there are certain rights that are protected, that are observed. But when it comes to me, in case after case, I learn about the complaint against me in the media before I formally get notification from the Judicial Service Commission. All complaints against me, there is not a single exception. Going back to the complaint in 2008, in fact, the judges of the Constitutional Court first went and, and commented publicly in the media. They were given time to formulate the complaint. So they first commented and said, we are complaining against Lope. The complaint did not even exist then. They were given time to formulate the complaint. That complaint uh, was formulated by judges that I did not even engage. Those that I allegedly spoke to are refusing to complain, but that complaint is still kept alive. Thereafter, there were other complaints which were not valid. I dealt with them. There is always something that is kept alive to keep me in the cage where I belong and keep me off the mainstream. It's done deliberately. So you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that there is a pattern. Considering that I'm not the only judge in this country 
that are, there are complaints against. There are many, many complaints in the judicial, pending before the Judicial Service Commission. As I said, there is a valid complaint against Chief Justice Muhoeng, which I brought, which was endorsed by Judge Park. He is yet to respond to that. So he hasn't responded to that. Maybe we should ask him why is he not responding to that. Hopefully he'll be willing to answer the question. <laughs> All right. I think um, now it is clear that um, you sort of you would say that the system has not been quite fair in dealing with your issues as judge president of the Western Cape as compared to other judges who are treated you know, differently from the way you are treated. Mm -hmm. And now we can only wonder why is that? Why specifically Judge President Lope? Well, I do not wish to speculate, but there is clear evidence that when it comes to the handling of complaints, my complaints against me are always magnified and treated differently. Always leaked to the media, no matter how nonsensical the complaint is, it is magnified, leaked to the media. I will tell you what, when this latest complaint first surface about the plot to assassinate a judge. When I looked at it, I found it absolutely ridiculous. My name was not mentioned. I laughed. I laughed. Then Natim Nube from the office of the CJ called me 10 minutes before the complaint was made public. That didn't help me anyway. He called me 10 minutes to say there is going to be a media statement issued because there is a complaint uh, that I am plotting, uh, I, I'm the mastermind plotting to assassinate Goliath. I laughed, I almost fell from the chair because it is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. But because my name is mentioned, everybody can see this is nonsense. Because my name is mentioned, every journalist wants to run with it. By the way, the Jigs report itself was read selectively by the Daily Maverick uh, journalist. If you read the report, there is no way any right-thinking person could dare acting on that report. But because my name is there, because it is seen as a vehicle to keep Shope out of circulation, to keep him in the controversy, to force me off the bench, to make me unhappy, there is also a political agenda. The former, uh, the former Premier of the Western Cape, uh, Helen Zilla, said publicly that John Shope is deployed by the ANC. She called me an ANC deployee. Indeed, I was appointed by the ANC, like every other judge in this country, given that the ANC is the government of the day. Every judge appointed since 1994 was appointed by the ANC. But not a single one of us, myself included, is an ANC deployee. She got away with that. So clearly there is a political agenda for the premier of the province to call a judge president serving in that province a political uh, 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 deployee. She said, I was deployed, I'm a political deployee, I'm deployed by the ANC. So there is a bigger political agenda, there is racism, there are issues uh, flowing directly from the racism report, which I authored, right? So it's a bigger agenda. And obviously they want to put their own people who's going to toe the line. I refuse to toe the line. Remember I said to you earlier on there are two options. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they want you to be their spokesperson, toe the line, and they speak through you. I refuse to be a puppet. Or if you refuse to be a puppet like me, you are standing there, you will always be targeted until you die. Speaking of the political agenda. Yes. There is a perception, and I'm glad you mentioned the name of Helen Zille. Yes. The DA in the Western Cape prefers to have their court matters had in the North Houting High Court. Yes. I'm wondering why all the way to the North and not in the Western Cape? Well, and, I'll... <laughs> and also, you know, just to add on that, you know, there are also people who think that the North Houting High Court has its own cabal of politicians 
who never loses cases there. Mm. They right. never lose cases there. Right. So here's the DA taking all their cases from the Western Cape to the North. Well, uh, in the Western Cape, clearly I've noticed there is that trend. Uh, <clears throat> It's not just matters where the DA is involved. There's also a trend whereby RAF matters, motor injury yes. matters, are taken to Gauteng. There, there is a clear explanation. I do not believe they belong to the High Court. I always encourage the parties to settle them, and I think a lot of practitioners don't like that kind of an approach. But it is working. A lot of them are now coming back to the Western Cape in respect of RAF matters, personal injury matters, where people were victims of motor accidents. In respect of political matters, it may well be that that is done in furtherance of their political agenda. Former Premier Helen Zilla publicly said on more than one occasion that I'm an ANC deployee, right? And she was allowed, she got away with that. Right. It may well be that they do not see this division uh, as a division where they will be getting the kind of favours, if any, that uh, they are getting elsewhere. I wish to say no more. As to whether or not uh, they stand a better chance of winning cases in uh, Gauteng, I don't think it's for me to comment. I do not want to, <laughs> to, to, to comment in that regard. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, they have succeeded, the DA, in creating this cloud around me. They were directly responsible through Helen Zilla. She said that publicly. And she was allowed to get away with that. I was not protected by the Chief Justice. I expected the Chief Justice of the country to protect me and say, Premier, what are you saying about the judge? I deserve that protection from the Chief Justice. I never got it. I'm still waiting for it. Okay, so in conclusion, um, Judge President of the Western Cape, Chopin, what, what sort of advice would you give to the young aspiring legal minds in the country? Firstly, the sky is the limit. They are fortunate to start the law where politically there is stability in the country, we studied law under apartheid, right? So they are fortunate because the legal system itself is now democratic, democratic, thereby creating a wide range of opportunities that did not exist at our time. The law itself has evolved, not just in this country, but uh, due to global politics and global inter uh, integration, the world has become even smaller. When we studied the law, you could only be a lawyer in South Africa, basically. There was not much you could do with the legal system then. I have a son, Jabulo, he has just returned from New York. He studied at VES, but he was able to go to New York and spend a whole year working in New York. So the sky is the limit. The opportunities are there. There are challenges, though. They must not take things for granted. They mustn't look uh, at us and think that we are comfortable. The fight must carry on. They must go there, particularly women and people from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds. Go there, put your foot in the system, but stay. Work hard, the sky is the limit. If you work hard, you stay focused, you know what it's all about, you are able to deal with the challenges as and when they come, but it's most important to stay focused. I can guarantee the sky is the limit. Judge President Lopez, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this was an exclusive interview with Judge President Lopez of the Western Cape. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much.